Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Endgame class. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and tonight I want to take you through some more practical Rook Endgames. So, we've done a lot, a lot, a lot of work on theoretical Rook Endgames, and a lot of, you know, 4 versus 3, right? We have this outside pass pawn idea, but I wanted to take it back a, a few steps and specifically talk about this idea of Rook activity and King activity in rook endgames so i think it's really important to talk about because it's great to have this theoretical understanding of these uh, different structures and talk about the various plans that you can enact there but there are going to be a lot of endgames that have many many pawns on the board and it's going to be a, a little bit more about what you can do with the pieces rather than what plans you can uh, can construct so let's let's talk about it. Let's talk about activity. I want to flip on over here to the board. It is no longer the Russian Championship. We have to get rid of that. All right. <laughs> and to start with here, we're not going to look at this. That's for later. We're going to look at a game between Solomon Floor and Milan Vidmar. So of course, Floor, of course, is a, a very famous player from back in the day. I myself have done a game review on it where I sat on the floor the entire time. But let's talk about this game. Uh, I don't care about any of this because this is not the end game. It's not what I'm here to discuss. And wait, hold on. All right, we have knight c6, knight take on c6, pawn, uh, rook c8, rook c5. Okay, b takes c6. We have arrived. We've arrived at the end game. Here we are. Uh, so what's going on? What's going on in this position? Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six pawns for black, one, two, three, four, five, six pawns for white. So it's clear that the material is even. Now, of course, though, the position is not even. Uh, it's far from equal here. Uh, of course, white is going to be the, the player with the advantage. Why is that? Well, we have a difference. This rook is passive, and this rook is active. And just for those of you who don't, don't know what this means, the white rook is spending its time making threats, attacking the pawn on c6, and the black rook is doomed to be defensive, or, or passive. It's working behind its own pawns, trying to keep white from invading. So how can we turn this slight advantage, uh, both in sort of structure and activity, into uh, sort of a winning advantage? Well. The first step is is probably apparent to most of you. We're not really at the point where we can try and turn this activity into any kind of advantage. We, of course, first need to include the kings. Kings are going to be very, very valuable in any sort of uh, simplistic endgame where there's only one or two pieces left on the board. They don't have to worry about getting checkmated as much, so they can participate in the battle. So we start with the move king e2. Black, of course, is going to follow suit with king e7. We have king d3 now, king d6, and the move king d4 here would be absolutely fine, but we actually see white first include rook a5, rook a8, and then uh, king to d4. Uh, okay, so what is what is going on here, right? We, we have the kings in the position, and let's put one more, more, one more move on the board for black, and that move is f5. Uh, okay, so... First things first, there is one more structural move that, that I sort of want to include before we, we take a step back and, and talk about uh, how to approach this position. So uh, priority number one is always making sure we have a good grip on things, and white does this with b4, just making sure that these two weaknesses are not going to be able to advance forward any further. And now we see black insert rook b8, just a, a tempo move on the, the b pawn, a3, rook back to a8. Okay. So now we have this position. So uh, obviously, white is going to be better here. We have the active rook, we have two targets to attack, and we have our opponent sort of in a more passive looking position. But how do we continue here? How do we turn this into a position that we can start to try to win? So I want to open this one up to the chat room. I'm curious what your guys' ideas are here, and maybe we can talk about some of those ideas, why some are correct, and why maybe some are not correct. White rook is getting passive, so I, I disagree. So just because the rook looks a little bit stuck in front of the 
in front of its own pawns does not mean it's passed. It's serving very active roles here and can easily switch over to the, C, uh, the C5 square and attack either of these pawns. It can also come back into the game if necessary. Okay, so there's a few ideas. There's a few ideas. So idea number one is to push through with a4 and b5, just keeping the fight on the queen side and coming for com coming for black over here. Okay, idea number two seems to be to try and gain space on the king side. Moves like h4, moves like f4 are being suggested. Uh, I haven't seen anyone say g4 specifically, but I think that's in, sort of in line with what you guys are, are saying, right? And then we have one more idea uh, making an appearance here making an appearance, and that is the idea of e4. So there's also some really good ideas being, you know, sort of typed out in actual words in the chat room as well. So one thing most people seem to agree on is that we need to do something on the king's side. Uh, it's not enough to try to win on the queen's side. We have this very famous principle, the principle of two weaknesses, right? It's not enough to win on one side of the board we have to sort of stretch our opponent a little bit more thin by creating threats on both sides of the board. That way, they won't be able to handle all of our threats and we will win the game. Uh, where we are having some differences is how to go about doing that. Before I get to that, I want to talk about a4, b5. So it is important to, to take a look at these kinds of ideas and, and see why they don't work. So a4 in this case is just tactically wrong due to the move rook b8. You have to go king c3. Now after rook b6, this rook is both passive, well sorry, both defensive, but no longer passive because it is actively attacking this pawn uh, on b4. And white's advantage is, is sort of completely nullified here. a4 just gives up the grip on the dark squares and allows black to, to get active. So a4 doesn't work. But a4 is, is a pretty good idea. It's, it's worth thinking about, at least, because if black didn't have this idea of rook b8, like let's say nothing happens, then b5 I think is going to be a pretty good advantage for white. You, you do have to worry about c5 check, but at the end of the day, um, is this winning? I think so, I don't know, maybe, uh, probably, uh, it, okay. <laughs> but a4, it's sort of a moot point because rook b8 is, is here for black. So good idea to think about, but with that out of the way, what does that mean? Well, that means we have no way through on the queen side, which means we do have to turn our attention to the king side of the board. And as I was saying, we do have some differences here in how to actually go about uh, doing that. So a lot of people were saying sort of this vague idea, we want to gain space on the king side. And that's a perfectly fine thing, uh, fine thing to say. Uh, wanting to gain space is perfectly reasonable. But the problem is, there's no real comfortable way to do that, right? Like you can play h4 and maybe you can argue this has improved your position, but you're not really going to play h5. Uh, you can play f4, but then this is perhaps giving yourself uh, your own weakness, your own backward pawn to worry about. And lastly, I, I just don't really think g4 is the way to go. Again, for the reason being that you're giving yourself sort of a weakness that you have to keep track of here. And in the meantime, what are you going to do with this extra space? Are you actually creating threats by having this extra space? Uh, I'm not so sure. Are you creating targets, things, you know, inroads for your king? I'm not so sure. So the correct idea, as mentioned by some in the chat, is to actually play e4. Uh, so why is this correct? Why is this the, the path forward for floor here? Well, the idea is we have this active rook here on a5, attacking this pawn on a6, easily able to attack the pawn on c6 as well. But our king, for the moment, has been blocked. So with e4, we are granting our king more access to the king's side of the board, where it can poke around, make some more threats. We're also aiming to open up this fifth rank for the rook, uh, just sort of increasing the activity and allowing it to access the king's side. Uh, but the, the most important idea here for white is this idea of finding a way for the king to contribute, right? It's not enough for this rook alone to be very active. We need the king in the game as well if we are to win. So e4, great move by floor. We have f takes e4 in the game. Black is trying to trade off as many pawns as possible, try and simplify things a little bit. Uh, there's, there's really not much other choice here. Otherwise, white is going to take on d5 and then 
win the game. So f takes c4, f takes c4, d takes c4, and king takes c4. Uh, and now black passes with rook to uh, rook to a7. So how do we continue now? How do we continue now? We gave ourselves great mobility with our king, right? Great mobility. Uh, what are we going to do with said mobility? What are we going to do? King back to d4, repeating the position. So yeah, now that we have this mobility, uh, the chat room is, is along the right thinking. We, we want to induce a weakness on the king side or, or start making threats on this side of the board. So king f4 is absolutely the way to start doing that. Uh, and with king f4, white is making a, a very, very, very distinct threat here. And that is to go king g5 and king h6. Uh, and now, quite simply, this, this is too much for, for black to have to deal with. We have our two weaknesses, right? We turned h7 into a weakness because we can attack it. And, and now black is going to, to very much be struggling to stay in this game. For example, if black were to pass with king e7, we can just increase our pressure here. Black has nothing better than to repeat. And at the end of the day, uh, I think we can actually now just break through with, with a4 and b5. Now this idea of getting active is not really going to be good because our king is attacking the second weakness over here on h7. And I, I think white should be, be easily winning here with two passed pawns. Uh, okay. So, of course, you know, Vidmar, pretty good chess player, not going to allow that. So we see h6. Uh, but the problem for black is that the further up the board these pawns move, the, the easier they can be attacked. So our priority now is to force a weakness on the king's side. For the moment, our king is blocked. All squares defended on the fifth rank. He's holding the line. So how do we uh, continue by uh, forcing through another weakness? How do we go here? What if black tried rook f8 check? Uh, I assume you mean rook f7. So yeah, this is playable, but um, yeah, I think maybe white would just retreat, and you have to come back to defend your pawn, and I'll just come up and board. And you have the, the same problems. If you go here now, then I'll, I'll take your pawn. Yeah, rook f7 is a good idea. And yeah, the, the chat is right right on the money here as well. You want to force a weakness with these pawns, and the way to do that is to use your own pawn sort of as, as a lever here. I'm going h4, h5, forcing these pawns forward and forcing one of them to be left behind. Uh, king e6 was black's choice in the game. Now we see king g4, just preparing h5, rook a8, and finally h5, g5 does come. So... We've done great so far. We've made a lot of progress. It might not look at it might not look like it because our opponent is kind of just passing back and forth and then playing playing the required moves when they need to, but we've actually made a ton of progress compared to the starting position. What we've done is given our king multiple inroads into the position. We can threaten to come this way with f5 g6 and we can threaten to come this way with c5 b6. And it's going to be difficult for black to keep both of those under control. Additionally, we've opened up our rook's access along the fifth rank so it can swing into the game whenever possible. Uh, and lastly, we've given ourselves a, a strong h5 pawn and an h6 pawn uh, that is quite weak. And notably, if this h6 pawn falls, it's a very short road to victory with h6, h7, h8. So a lot of progress has been made in the past five moves. So I'm going to go back and go through those again. So it's really important to understand how we got here. Uh, we started our thinking process here after the move rook a8. We have this active rook, but our king's not participating. So e4 is the way to go. Why is e4 the way to go? Well, with this pawn back on e3, it's simply too difficult to get this king anywhere. Like, you're not going on some marathon journey. Uh, these things are, are, are kind of just too slow. You, you don't really achieve anything 
by taking these these uh, th this long long journey over to h4. So we go e4 in order to give our king a path uh, to the king's side and sort of widen the beachhead. Is D Dvoretsky, if you read Dvoretsky's endgame manual, he says this so many times. So what does he mean by that? I honestly don't understand the metaphor, but the point now is that we have widened the, the front that black needs to defend. Black still needs to keep control over c5 and c6. Now he also has to worry about this side of the board as well. And that is the mechanism that stretches black's forces too thin and allows white to win the game. So then we come over to the king's side and use this path in to create a weakness over here on h6. Uh, okay, so what to do now? Well, now we should bring our king back to the center, of course, where it's the most active. Uh, floor actually starts with the move g3, which is just a nice little subtlety here, uh, guarding the, the f4 square as well, keeping control of some dark squares, and getting off the, the second rank. Uh, name, namely, though, the, the main point is just to control uh, the, the f4 square. It, it could be relevant in some lines, but not the most important move of all time. So rook a7, king f3, rook a8, black is sort of doomed to this passivity for now. We get king e4, rook back to a7. Uh, and our king is now centralized. So first they repeat the position, uh, and then Floor finds the path forward. So we have improved our position pretty much to the maximum here, right? We drew Black's pawns forward into a more vulnerable, vulnerable position. We gave our king two paths that our opponent has to look out for, uh, has to keep track of. They have three weaknesses now that to, to, to look for, a weakness on the queen side and a weakness on the king's side. So how do we actually break through? How do we pull forward here? <laughs> so, okay, this g3 move I should mention is not exactly the Steinitz rule. It's sort of the anti-Steinitz rule. For those who don't know, Steinitz rule is that the pawn is best placed on its starting square because you can then choose to move it one square or two squares depending on what the situation calls for, and this lets you win a lot of mutual zugzwangs. In this case, black was not in zugzwang, black was just passing. So g3, not really the same idea. Uh, in this case, it's more for the squares that the pawn controls, is my argument. But yeah, easily confused ideas. Sorry to go on that, that tangent there. But uh, Anyways, the, the chat has the right idea here. Um, the idea is, is simply rookie five check. Uh, and the point now is that again, we have two different paths in. And after rookie five, the black king can really only stop us from doing one of those paths. So rookie five check is correct. And in the game, Vidmar shows uh, king to d6. Let's talk a little bit though about king to f6 and what would happen here. So really importantly here, I think white actually does have a, a few paths forward, but uh, yeah, I think g4 is, is going to be the idea. Sorry, I had to remember what was going on after king f6. Uh, but yeah, g, g4 is going to be really nice. Black has nothing better than to pass and then after this, we can uh, play rook c5, rook a5, and invade with the king. This is the point. We, we do this little funny maneuver to gain a tempo, get our rook out of the way, and then we'll invade on, a, on, on, the, on the queen side here. So king f6 does in fact allow the king into the queen side and allows white to win, uh, to, to win the game. So I just had to remember how the details worked out there. So once again, Maybe g4 isn't even required. You can probably just do this. And king d4. This is the winning idea here for white. I think it's good to include g4 to stop king f5, but not entirely necessary. Uh, so king f6 allows the king in on the queen's side. Now king d6, as played in the game, is perhaps uh, you know a, a pretty good attempt as well. Uh, it turns out that white could have just simply won with king f7, I believe. After rook f7 check, we do have king g6. And this king and pawn endgame is hopelessly lost, so white could have invaded. But Floor found a different path forward now with rook to e8, keeping the king cut along this file. 
Uh, and the one idea for black to try to break free, unfortunately, for Vidmar is just not working. Uh, c5 seems to be uh, breaking loose from white's grip on the position, and perhaps would be, but white again has multiple paths forward. Not rook c8, the arrow uh, that you just saw was incorrect, by the way. <laughs> but b takes c5, and rook e6 is one path forward. That would be quite good. But uh, Floor accurately calculated that rook to d8 check is uh, quite simply winning a pawn. Uh, the natural king to c7 loses to rook h8. When after uh, really any move, let's say c takes b4, we have check, take, take. And then everybody calculated. Everybody calculated. I know you guys, you would never skimp out on calculating this. Everybody calculated all the way. All the way. I know you, you made it this far to equals bishop when, when of course, the pawn on a2 cannot queen. So <laughs> rook d8 check, actually a pretty sick move because Flora had to calculate out this silly king and pawn endgame where after takes we can check and take and win the game because we're just so fast with our king. Um, so rook d8 check, king c6, Vidmar did spot the idea, and now rook c8 check, rook takes c5, simply picks up this pawn, and now it's quite clear that this king is going to invade. Uh, rook h7 was played, rook e5, uh, king c6, rook e6 check, and now king f5. And after rook f7, rook f6, Vidmar went ahead and resigned. So how quickly things go wrong, right? How quickly things go wrong. After we played e4, was there no drawing resource for Vidmar? So I sort of did this on purpose. I didn't talk a whole lot about Black's defensive opportunities. In the game, Vidmar sort of put up the bare minimum resistance, just passing back and forth, allowing White to, to do all these, these active ideas. So now we're going to take a second look at this endgame, and rather than look at it from the attacking side, which in my opinion might be the easier side, we're going to take a look at it from the defensive side and see if we can find some way to, uh, to to fight back a little bit more. But before we do that, let's review just a little bit how we got here from the attacking side. So we started once again in this position. We needed to uh, widen the area that Black had to, to worry about. Right now he only worries about the queen side. We have to make him worry about the queen's, the king side as well. So e4 uh, is the move in the game. Now our king has a great path to attack these pawns over here. Rook a7, we go h6 is forced to stop us from invading and now we use our h pawn as a little bit of a lever to pry open some weaknesses here now we re-centralize our king and repeat moves one time and now rookie five check is nice to force our opponent to pick a side if he goes to f6 then we can invade on the queen side and if they go to d6 then we see in the game king f5 would be winning but rook e8 check is the accurate move by floor, taking advantage of this check idea when the end game wins, and then we simply pick up this pawn and invade with our king, and the game's over. Just like that, the game's over. Easy enough. So, 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 chat room. Let's do it. Let's do it with the other side now. Let's do it with the other side. What's going on in this position for black? I'm curious if anybody can come up with an idea to escape this bind. We are so, so sad that we are forced to be passive forever and ever. Because we've seen that this passive defense is not enough for black. White is able to make threats on the king's side, stretch our forces thin. And as Magnus Carlsen said, there are no fortresses in chess. This is definitely not one of those non-existent fortresses. So how? How do we break free? H4, H5 is the most counterintuitive. Okay, let me talk about that one more time while you guys are thinking here. So Manny is talking about when the pawns were on H6 and G6 and White played H4, H5. The key point there is that G6 is blocking the White King's inroad to the position on F5. So we go H4, H5 to draw this pawn forward and now our king has access to another path inward through the f5 square. Also very importantly, h5 is going to be a strong pawn, quite close to queen, if the h6 pawn ever falls. So that's the nuance with that maneuver there. 
Okay, everybody's saying rook b8. I don't know if you guys paid attention, but that's what happened in the game. And then white defended the pawn, and then black had to come back because this pawn was hanging. Okay? Everybody, everybody catch that? So, not rook b8. That ain't it, boss. That ain't it. After rook b8, rook b6. So this is actually a worse setup for black. Um, I mentioned this idea. Um, if a4 here, then black goes rook b8, rook b6. And the point now is that the black rook defends the pawns and actively attacks the pawn on b4. However, sorry, in this position, if we go rook b6, then our rook does not actively attack a weakness because this pawn is quite simply defended. And now it's a, a worse version of this passive defense because after I play the move h4, for example, um, and sorry, let's not even play h4. Let's play rook a4, rook a5, and then play a move, right? You, you just get zugged, right? This rook cannot pass anymore, and, and then you, you get busted. So that's not active. That's not active. So we need to do better. Sacrifice the A pawn to activate the rook. So we're going to sacrifice something to activate the rook, but it might not be material. It might not be material. So Harry Bowman seems to be on top of things tonight. Seems to be on top of things. So yeah, we'd love to activate this rook somehow. We want to get this rook in the game on some sort of opening file. But we can't for the moment because our A-pawn dies. And that's super sad. I like my A-pawn. I don't want him to die. So... The thing that we're sacrificing is going to be our king activity. So the very, very counterintuitive move, king c7, uh, is actually going to be correct here. And the point is, in rook and pawn, in king, rook, and pawn endgames, uh, oftentimes the rook activity is a lot more important than king activity. I'm going to say that again. A lot of the time, rook act, uh, a lot of the time, rook activity is more important than king activity, and that's the case here. So rather than have the king sort of battling the king and the rook uh, battling the rook, in a sense the king passively stopping white from invading, and the rook passively stopping white's rook from invading, we sort of do two jobs at once with the king on c7. White can try to invade with king c5, and now we go king b7. And the key point here is that no matter what white does, we are now free from our prison on a7 and a8. We can bring the rook into the game and fight back uh, rather actively. And I think this is the best way for black to continue in the game. By the way, this is a position in Vretsky's Endgame Manual, and I just wanted to mention, I didn't come up with this king c7, king b7 idea on my own. This is included in, in that analysis there. So just wanted to be clear on that. Not trying to take credit for this brilliant idea here. Exquisite Corpse is doing some math in the chat. King controls 8 squares max. Rook can control 16. I disagree. I disagree with your numbers. Then he corrected to 15. I still disagree. Isn't it 14? We're, we're getting a little bit beside the point here. But the point is... Rook activity, more important than king activity, so black allows white's king to enter the position and dooms his own king to passivity, in this case, in order to activate the rook on the e-file. So white can and probably should continue to invade with something like king to d6, and now there are actually a variety of ways for black to come back into the game. So uh, I mentioned rook e8, so let's start with this one. Rook e8 is perhaps the, the simplest idea. Now, rook a3 is going to be the point for white. And uh, I want to sort of uh, start my, my disclaimers now. So here are my disclaimers, right? In general, rook activity is more important than king activity. But that being said, whenever you do something like this and allow the white king to invade, there are going to be a lot of specifics that you have to worry about. So in this instance the specifics do actually work out for black this is going to be a good drawing attempt for black but it's not to it's not to say that this is like the the blanket rule that you should always follow who cares if the king invades just activate your rook you'll be fine 
because there are some very tangible threats that white has or that black has to deal with here and you do have to walk a rather thin line in order to uh, uh, avoid falling into some of these some of these ideas so black to move here what do you guys want to do in the chat room here what do you guys want to do Okay, everybody hates their pawns. Everybody wants to sacrifice one pawn or the other. King b6 has also been suggested. So it's important to understand what white is uh, what white is doing. So what is what is white doing? And what are we doing about it? Sit on this position, king b6, king b7. So this is the, the thing to look out for here. Uh, white is not passing the time here. White, uh, with this active active king, is now able to just make threats on, on the queen side that you have to look out for. So something like king b6 maybe is playable, but you do have to be very cautious about moves like rook c3. When all of a sudden, this guy is attacked two times and defended once. And don't even think about playing rook c8. Get get out of my chat room if you want to play rook c8 here. We're not playing passively anymore. We're getting active. So you do have to be just a little bit careful. Just a little bit cautious of these kinds of things. And by the way, if you're saying f4, uh, I just want to mention if you wanted to play f4, you, you should do it here. So this is the slightly more complex way that black could, uh, could play for some, some active play. Uh, and I was going to go over this secondly, but playing f4 sort of a move later is, is just a worse version. The idea of f4 isn't really to invade with the rook, it's to uh, pu push the pawn up the board and sort of threaten to make a queen and find active play this way. So f4 is, is not the worst idea ever, but in this case it doesn't make uh, as much sense. Uh, okay, so what else? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about f4 here as well, though, with the idea of invading with the rook, but, but what other ideas? Okay, everybody, everybody just wants to sacrifice a pawn here. Everybody's saying, yeah, I don't care. Get rid of these pawns. Uh, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about f4 here. Uh, I do think f4 is the, the, the better way forward, uh, doubling white's pawns, uh, and then d4. I think the, the d5 pawn uh, can be quite strong in many instances, so we, we tend to want to keep this, this passed pawn if we can. So let's say f4 and then rook e2. What's going on here? What's going on here? Well, in this instance, white is actually able to make use of this f pawn with the move g4, right? With the move g4. We can take a pawn on h2, but this extra pawn isn't really going to make any difference here, right? All of a sudden, we may live to regret allowing our opponent's king to d6 when it's a short step away from uh, allowing this f pawn to promote. So f4 doesn't quite cut it. So then let's go back to d4. Maybe d4 is a better way of doing things, and perhaps it is. But in this case, after rook e2, I think white can just simply continue with rook c3. And while we are going to be gaining some pawns back here, uh, I'm not so sure that we're entirely happy with the end result. Right, This past d-pawn is going to be a little bit scary. Going to be a little bit scary. And there's a lot of work to be done before uh, this, this position is, is over. Is white winning here? I don't know. Rook endgames are hard. But definitely not the best idea for black to, uh, to, to aim for this. Uh, you should be very, very scared if you get into this position. Uh, okay, now are there any nuances where we can do a bit better? Let's take a look. Maybe rook d2 is a good idea to come after this guy, but there are a couple uh, different ways forward here. For example, rook c4 is putting black into a little bit of a zugzwang, right? Tough to make any moves. Can't move the king. I'll take your guy. Can't move this guy. I'll take your guy. And we, we sort of transpose. 
And there's just simply not, not much else to do here. If you take g2 and try to take h2 instead of a2, uh, now the problem you run into is that uh, this a pawn is going to be pretty relevant on a4. We can make another pass pawn on the king's side, and again, or sorry, the queen side, and again, white is going to be better. So f4 and d4, good ideas, but they should have been played here. If you wanted to do this, you should have played f4 here and made use of this d-pawn rather than going for this active rook. So, what else? What else? What else to do? Harry Bowman likes king b6. So let me go back a little bit. So yeah, king b6... Uh, you guys have to, have yet to answer me. What are you doing about rook c3? White is making a, a very distinct threat here. You have to be a bit cautious. So the problem with those types of pawn moves is they they aren't really passes, right? They they aren't really passes like. You know, you move a pawn, then white passes with king d7, then you move another pawn, then white passes with king d6, and eventually you run out of pawn moves. Now play f4. Okay, I'll take. What's different here? What's so different? I'm not sure. With King B five to follow. I don't I don't understand the point. Don't understand the point. So yeah, maybe you can do something like this again with some d4 ideas, but yeah, I don't think it's it's the, the principled way for it. So as some people in the chat are saying, g5 uh, is a really great idea here. And what's the point? Well, the point is actually sort of, sort of multi-purpose in this case. Number one, we want to play f4 and activate with our rook uh, coming in to e2. But we're not so happy about giving white this super strong past f pawn like g4 f5 that that comes really really quickly so black just plays g5 with the idea of f4 to follow now excuse me if we do see the move rook c3 uh perhaps f4 is going to be good enough but i think there's actually a second idea here for black in the form of g4 surprise idea g4 and the point now is that if you take here, I will take here, and you are not really making a passed pawn. I'm gonna take on f3 next, if you take me, then we are getting into pretty simplified territory here. And sorry, maybe you lose a rook if you do that. So rook h2, rook takes a2, rook takes h7, and white is not gonna win this game. Uh, it's just too simplified. One of these pawns is going to drop off the board, White, black will be able to take the B pawn in exchange, or at least get that pawn off the board, and, and it's just going to be uh, a dead draw. Okay, so G4, surprise idea, surprise idea. So, is white powerless? No, white can play the move F4 and try to keep things closed, but now black is still able to find activity with the move rook E4. Rook takes on C6. And then I think rook takes b4 is the idea, uh, but maybe even rook takes e3 is still quite strong here. Yeah, let's let's say rook takes e3. And we're getting into some things that are very similar, where white just cannot keep everything together. And black is approaching uh, a draw. So g4, really, really cool idea. g5, g4. Not necessarily finding activity by immediately breaking into the second rank, but finding activity by activating on the e4 square. So for example, f4, rook e4, a3 even, and then rook c4 is going to be a good idea for black. And sorry, yeah, so rook takes c6, maybe we should actually be taking on, on b4. Uh, my memory is, is failing me here. I just remember that like a3 is the best try 
for white, but then this loses, or sorry, maybe doesn't lose, but is quite bad in light of rook to c4. So rook e4, really cool idea, really cool idea. What if not f4? Uh, well, th then what? Then what? I was looking at rook c6, but rook takes c3 is is good enough for um, for white. And if we just pass here, then uh, perhaps any number of things, but maybe simplest is to take here, or even just push with with h5. Just push with h5 as well. All right, so what was the point of this endgame? Well, number one, we saw really great winning technique by Solomon Floor in the game, uh, where he constricts the position and then plays e4, widening the fronts, makes threats on the queen side, gives his king an inroad, and then invades on one side or the other and is able to win the game. On the other hand, we could have seen from black, a really instructive idea of freeing up the rook by allowing the enemy king to invade. Pretty counterintuitive stuff, but good enough for a draw in this case, activating the rook. Uh, and once again, by the way, those of you who are fans of f4, I think this is the best moment to, uh, to do it here. If e takes f4, then you can do something like d4. And, you know, it is a little bit scary to be sacrificing pawns like this, but uh, you get this nice d pawn in return. And what's the evaluation of this position? Uh, I honestly don't know for certain, but uh, this would be a good sort of drawing idea uh, or a drawing attempt for black. Maybe not king b6, maybe something like something crazy like a5 or c5. But you get the point. You get the point. Black plays for counterplay and gets active. This is the point of this endgame. So rook e8, and then we get this nice g5, g4 idea, with the point being we want to open up this e4 square and come over to c4 or take on b4. So questions on this endgame? Questions on this endgame? King takes white pawn. I do not accept your question. This is not Jeopardy. Questions come in the form of questions, not in the form of answers. Yeah, d3 immediately I don't think quite works. I think there's a king d7 move there, and then you lose lose the pawn, d2 or d3. Good question, though, Santi. Good question. Actually, no, it wasn't a good question. You phrased it in the form of an answer. Ridiculous. How would I do it if I played this? Uh, well, I, I'd like to think I would play like king c7, king b7, but I don't know. This is the best way to play, so in an ideal world, I would do this, but in the world we live in, maybe I would just lose horribly. That sounds about right. Is it a drawn position? Computer evaluation. So uh, in Dvoretsky's endgame manual, he evaluates it as a draw, but this is not really the type of position that you can just ask a computer, say, hey, computer, tell me, is it a win or a draw? And it'll tell you, you sort of have to do a lot of work, which thankfully, Tvoretsky has, has done for me in many of these cases. <laughs> All right, well, we only got to this one, um, one end game here tonight, but we only have a, a few minutes left, so I think rather than try and cram in a, a whole second end game, I am just going to call it here a little bit early. It gives us some more time to do Analyze Your Games on Twitch right after this. So thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, hopefully you found this end game uh, at least a little bit instructive. This idea of retreating the king back to b7 uh, I, I think is really counterintuitive. At, at least it was to me. But it activates that rook. It gets that rook active, and that's enough for black to hold on here. So uh, once again, thank you guys so much for watching. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time as I flip away. Goodbye.